This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. This is going to be a giant discussion. I mean, literally a giant discussion. Welcome to a view from the bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Honored to be uh, sharing a, uh, a, a microphones and a connection with the three gentlemen we're going to bring in here. It's kind of a roundtable discussion that just sort of grew out of a, a Facebook messenger post uh, or message earlier this week. Uh, so very briefly, since we're just doing this in audio and I can't point to these guys on screen, uh, and that's by design because I haven't shaved in three days, uh, we're going to uh, bring them all in one at a time. First, a, a pastor in uh, Colorado who uh, is one of the few pastors who's actually been brave enough to write a book about this subject, the book uh, Giants, Sons of the Gods. We welcome uh, Doug Van Dorn to the program, Doug. Good to be back with you, Derek. That was the uh, crowd going wild there. <laughs> Our friendly neighborhood PhD, who uh, is the one who uh, his his podcast interview with Doctor Future about Panias, the Grotto of Pan, and. Uh, pointing out that that was exactly where Jesus said, you know, the gates of hell, which, uh, by the way, are right over here, will not prevail against the church that he's building on this rock, which is the 9,200 foot mountain right behind me. Like, boom, that was like a jaw dropping moment. Uh, Our friendly neighborhood Ph.D. author of Interview with the Giant Ethno Historical Notes on the Nephilim, Dr. Judd Burton. Judd, welcome back. Good to be back. And again, the crowd goes wild. Drinking the crowd praise in. <laughs> and a gentleman who's uh, used his skills as a uh, an award-winning Hollywood screenwriter to help those of us who uh, want to see how this might have played out in history. And as the author of the Chronicles of the Nephilim, Chronicles of the Apocalypse, Chronicles of the Watchers, we welcome Brian Gadawa back to the program. Brian, good to see you again. No, that's yeah. no, the sound of wind. <laughs> I, I had a cricket sound effect queued up, but I missed the button. Oh, yeah, yeah. darn it. That would have been great. <laughs> so, so, Doug, you and Judd, before we started recording, you said uh, that you two had had a discussion that kind of led to the inspiration for what will be a roundtable uh, discussion on the subject of the Watchers, possibly the Nephilim, uh, and the relevance and importance to us as uh, Christians. What, what was it that prompted this idea? Well, whatever I forget, Judd can jump in, but... Uh, we, we've been writing a paper on the uh, Serpent Mound that we've talked about on your show before. And oh, yeah. We want to get that published. And, you know, we keep coming up with new things that we're discovering and finding out about it. And one thing led to another. And we just started talking about when the origins of this thing might have been. And there's there's some reason to think that it could go back to the same time as Gobekli Tepe. And so that would put us way pre-flood. And then we started talking about the Watchers pre-flood and and what happened to them and, and uh, you know, what happened after the flood with them and who were these guys? Um, is there any way we can know, you know, what, what about the overlaps in Israel and in Greece and Egypt and Babylon? And, and uh, as we're talking about this, <clears throat> we're realizing that we're not necessarily agreeing on everything. And then, you know, I just started thinking about some of Brian's views and some of your views and how different they are, but they all have different things to bring to the table. And we just thought, boy, it could be a, a really interesting discussion to talk about anything from who were these guys to kind of, you know, what's going to happen in the future, given that we all have kind of different millennial views. Uh, and it's not, you know, it's not not often that people that have post-millennial and all-millennial and pre-millennial get together in a friendly conversation can actually talk to each other about things. So especially things of this nature. So I, I think it would be really fascinating. And I feel like I would be the one learning more than anybody else in this group. So uh, I just remember that I was drinking a lot of coffee that night <laughs> and we were, we, we sat pondering over many, a, a, a volume of quaint and curious forgotten lore. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, that's pretty much the long and short of it. Uh, Doug and I got to talking and um, got off on a tangent. In the, the material of the paper we were talking about, and, or, or writing, rather, and um, started talking about identities in um, uh, regional pantheons uh, that, that might match up with watcher identities. And... Uh, it just sort of took off from there. So for viewers or listeners, because uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're just seeing a static image because uh, this is auto posted from uh, my Spreaker account. So uh, 
if if I have time this week, and I'm not sure I will, I might, uh, you know, intersperse a few images and stuff and actually create a video of this. But uh, in case you're wondering about the serpent mound that Doug referenced, we're talking about uh, this this ridge, uh, kind of an S-shaped ridge that's located a quarter of a mile north of uh, 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 Gilgal Rephaim in the Golan Heights. And uh, Doug gets credit for being the one who first spotted this via Google Earth uh, independently, like six years later, Sharon and I found it and then realized as I was looking, surely someone else has noticed this thing out there that looks like a serpent that's three times longer and five times higher than the so-called Great Serpent Mound in Ohio. And oh, yeah, look, it's covered with megalithic tombs on the back. Somebody must have noticed this. Nobody has noticed it, or at least not noticed or, and publicly admitted that it's shaped like a serpent and located in the land of Bashan, which is basically ugaritic for serpent serpent uh so you know except for doug and i saw doug's uh, post at, at his blog about it his uh, uh gog blog um and then found that uh, it was in the book which i have a copy of on my kindle so uh yeah i should have spotted this years ago but it wasn't until sharon and i were producing our video for our tour of israel and i was looking for the direction of the gates in in gilgal rephaim you know what's in that direction that i found that that uh, serpent shaped ridge um I, i'm i'm really curious though what what sort of conclusions are you guys coming to as far as uh, the age and the purpose of that thing oh <laughs> or is that something you can't disclose until it's been published? Um, we could probably talk superficially uh, about it. There's some things that, uh, and I think Doug would probably concur. Um, he can use our secret sign language that we have if, if he does or doesn't. I'm just kidding. We don't really have a secret sign language. <laughs> you couldn't see it anyway, right? Yeah. Um, no, uh, uh, what well, I think what we can talk about is um, is some of the uh, the snake symbolism itself. You know, right now one of the ideas that we're working off of that we developed in the paper is the idea that um, uh, along with other serpent mounds in the world, there seem to be. Um, uh, these patterns that emerge, that there's an undulating snake and there's some sort of circular object in proximity to it. Hmm. Um, and that's definitely what you have in the Golan with the Serpent Mound and Gilgal Rephaim. And I started thinking about it. I, uh, I had a nasty pile of books in my, my library of, of about every comparative religious author that I have. <laughs> Hmm. And so I'm just trying to go through all kinds of, of, you know, is there a pattern here that are missing? It occurred to me that these circles um, might be stylized uh, uh, or, or uh the snake eating its tail, which is a, a, a celestial symbol and was certainly one that was well known in, in the ancient Near East and uh, probably even in prehistory. And um, if, if that's the case, it's it's also a fertility symbol, by the way. It's a stylized womb, um, and that's certainly present in the the serpent mounds that you find in North America, uh, where most of the the circular objects in conjunction with those mounds are um, uh, thought of as eggs. I'm thinking notably of the Ohio mound where the the natives, I think, have traditionally interpreted that as uh, a snake eating an egg. But you have you have male and female symbolism there with the snake and the uh, the undulating snake, and then the the Ouroboros. Um, and in the, in the case of of the serpent mount of Bashan, uh, you're looking at uh, Gilgal Rephaim as a, as the stylized stylized Ouroboros, which brings up all kinds of new questions uh, as as to how old um, the the megalithic site itself is. Uh, and I'll, I'll let Doug pick up there uh, if he wants to add anything. But that's that's one of the big threads that we're we're looking at. Yeah. Uh... You know, if, if we kind of just assume for, for right now that, that the thing is pre-flood, which we think that there's 
good reason to do that, then that kind of brings in a whole different set of questions as to who built this thing and why they would have done it. And if we're going back to the days of Enoch and and uh, the watchers coming down on Mount Hermon, which is right in view with it and, in fact, aligned with it, mm-hmm. um, you know, could the watchers have actually themselves had something to do with building this? And if so, who would they have been um, and what would have been their purpose? So, Well, Brian, that's one of the uh, skills that you bring to this uh this analysis is to trying to figure out uh, motives and motivations for characters. If you had to speculate um, as you do in in your series of your various series of novels, the, uh, uh, the activity of the supernatural realm, what would be the purpose of taking this, uh, this serpent shaped Ridge, which uh, according to the the one guy who I found is excavated on the back of that Ridge, Dr. Michael Freakman. um, He argues that it's a, uh, what do they call it? A basalt flow. In other words, uh, uh, lava that was ejected from a, 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 an extinct volcano, which are all over the Golan um, years and years ago. But clearly there was some purpose to it because otherwise you wouldn't have like 140 different megalithic tombs on the back of this thing. Um, What would the uh, motive be for the spirit realm, the principalities, powers, whatever, to encourage their followers to say, hey, look, look at this big serpent shaped thing here. Let's here. Here's where you should bury all your dead. Yeah. Well, you guys have definitely done a lot more of research on that, that material than I have. But but um, yeah, it definitely it definitely seems to um, it seems to fit the motif, at least, you know, that 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 a lot of the watcher material that we know of, whether it's in the book of Enoch or, or even in, in the scriptures, et cetera, it does seem to match that, that motif, you know? So I'm actually, I'm inter- actually interested in, in when you get that thing published, I'd love to read it. So in fact, I'd love to read it before you get it published. If you, if you'll send it to me, <laughs> I would love to it too. <laughs> I promise I won't, I won't send it out. <laughs> But you use Leviathan as uh, a character in a number of your your novels, Brian. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Bashan, w- one of the things that startled me, which I probably should have learned earlier in researching this, uh, was realizing that um, some of the older Mesopotamian tales of a, a warrior god who has to defeat a chaos serpent or chaos dragon, um, there, there's a little inscripted uh, or, or carved uh, shell or something from like the 26th century BC that shows Ninurta battling a seven headed serpent. And in Akkadian, that serpent was called Bashmu, which is the cognate for Bashan. So you've got a very, very old tradition that connects Bashan, uh, the place of the serpent, at least in terms of the name with this story of chaos that has to be subdued by a warrior God in order to bring uh, the, the natural order to reality. And which, of yeah. course, is just a twisting of Genesis one. Yeah, yeah. It, plus, if you look in the in the Gnostic literature, which is later, but it does have a, a history and a tradition. You know, there is that inversion of the of the uh, uh, you know the the snake motif, where it's a posit- man is positively growing by the wisdom that he gets from the serpent. You know, and so there's that definite inversion go. But lately, I've been um, because of my latest novel on Moses. I've you know I've been doing a lot of reading on Egyptian. And I was fascinated to find that that there's also the um, there is a sea serpent of chaos as well in Egypt, and it's called Apophis. And um, you know he's 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 the 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 um, chaotic element that Ra has to battle when he goes in the netherworld on his solar boat during the night, right? So the idea is that Ra crosses the sky in his solar boat during the day, and then at night in the west he enters. Um, in the West, and that's the Netherworld, and it's not quite the same as the Middle Eastern version of the Netherworld, but it's similar. And then he fights this the sea serpent a couple times, but he has his other gods with him, you know, battling it like Set and Isis, I think, is with him. And but um, uh, but I was fascinated to find that there is there is some literature because you know the ancient Egyptian, of course, you know, we're talking millennia, right? And and their myths develop over time, and there is ancient references to Apophis as being multi-headed. And so that was fascinating because, you know, we mm. know that the Leviathan is multi-headed in Psalm 74. Lotan or Leviathan in Canaan is also seven heads. So it's fascinating to see that common motif. And, uh, but it was, it, you know, it did, it did have a negative concept in, in Egypt, but, um, and, and in fact, it does also in Canaan too, right? So, mm-hmm. 
it's kind of interesting. And it, it 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 literally translates to wreathed serpent. The whether you whether you have the the bet or the lamed variation of of Bashan or Lotan, they they both mean wreathed serpent. So we're dealing with a multi-headed uh, creature there. So here's the question throughout you guys then. Um, since since the that Leviathan creature is in most in really, I mean, you know, Tiamat in Babylonia, right? So how is it that that creature is negative, or at least the chaos creature? Yet at the same time, there's this sort of elevation or worship of the servant. Serpent. How do those? How do those two, th- apparently, in my mind, in a way, they're contradictory. So how how do they fit together? I think that that's that's probably thematic in perennial in in serpent lore around the world. Um, you know, when you think of uh, Kukulkan or Quetzalcoatl. In Mesoamerica, uh, he, the feathered serpent is this engine of creation and destruction. Uh, and so, I, I think that you know you're hard pressed to find where there's going to be much variation beyond that. A- as to as to why that's the case, um, if if the if we're if the identity here is the Nakash. Um, then the only creation that he's really capable of is refor- reformation, not actual creation. And when he gets when he when he gets involved, there can there can either be order or there can be chaos. And so that's why I think that you see these accompanying motifs um, in the lore of of serpents and dragons uh, uh, throughout the course of the world. I think this is certainly true in ancient Near Eastern tradition. Yeah, you you make a good point because, again, you know, forgive me, I'm, since I've spent a lot of time in Egypt, uh, in my imagination, um, I'm going to have a lot of those references. But, yeah, that was, you know, of course, we do know that the order and chaos is the perennial motif, probably one of the most primal themes mm-hmm. of, of history. And, of mm-hmm. course, it's clearly in the Bible, but – Certainly in Egypt as well, it's the same thing. It's the order and creation and creation versus, I'm sorry, order versus chaos, you know. And of course, Pharaoh was supposed to, he would bring the order uh, in the chaos. You know, he was uh, Horus on earth and all that. But but uh, that does seem to make sense because the other thing that, that honest, quite honestly, I haven't thought much about this. And I'm curious if you guys have is, uh, and, and how it plays into that is, you know the 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 seraph the seraphim in God's throne room right. are serpentine. Yeah. Yes. And so is that you know how at what is, so so is that part of that good thing gone bad or I don't know. Well, that would be my guess, and I, and you got there before I did. But yeah, Numbers twenty one, you've got the fiery serpents, which is uh, seraph Nakash, and Nakash usually translated serpent in the Bible. But you, so it, it apparently that those terms are used, at least in connection with one another, if not interchangeably. Uh, Isaiah, in a couple of spots, uh, Isaiah 14, talks about the flying fiery serpents. So, um, you know, uh, in Isaiah 6, he describes the, uh, the seraphim before God's throne, but he doesn't describe them as serpentine. But uh, again, true. elsewhere, you've got these, uh, the connection between the seraph and the, the nakash. So... Uh, it it may be that not all of these supernatural entities um, that are serpentine were considered evil, which might explain the Uraeus as the symbol of protection for the pharaohs. Yeah. Yeah. Here's one more question for you guys uh, related to chaos. So you go back to the beginning, the very beginning of the Greek pantheon, and you have what at the top? You have chaos. Chaos gives birth to everything else. Do you see any kind of a... A similarity between Leviathan as chaos monster, and then you know go to the Enuma Elish, and you see the chaos monster there, and and having this god chaos at the top of the Greek pantheon. Is there a serpentine element in the Greek? I haven't. I have. Well, you do in the uh, the later chaos monster, the one that was birthed by Gaia and Tartarus, uh, Typhon. Typhon. And uh, what's really fascinating about that is that the connection between Typhon and the battle that he has with Zeus is connected to the mountain that later became sacred to Baal, Mount Zaphon. In fact, some scholars think that the name Typhon derives from Zaphon. 
So the watchers as a as a group, um, they're mentioned in Daniel chapter four. So we can assume then that the watchers are not all evil because in Daniel, Daniel four, this is the context of Nebuchadnezzar's dream where he's uh, punished for his his pride and they tell him that he's going to go mad for a while. But the punishment is by decree of the watchers. So does that mean God has then delegated to a certain group of watchers some responsibility for overseeing the earth? Does this mean uh, yeah. how many of them are, are faithful, unfaithful? What, what kind of responsibilities might they have? What, what are watchers? You know, Enoch uh, articulates some identities of, of, of watchers that are still loyal to Yahweh. Um, you know, we've got, I think there are maybe three or four that they meant that he mentions. Um, off the top of my head, uh, Uriel and Raphael are are two of the personalities that are uh, in, um, amongst the ranks of the Watchers uh, that remain loyal to Yahweh. As to as to what they what their duties are, um, there does seem to be the implication of some kind of guardianship, uh, or, or at least at least vigilance. How that fits into the um, how what was it that Sharon said? Theopolitics. How that fits into the <laughs> theopolitics of the heavenly realms has yet to be uh, discerned. Um, I I would be at the front of the line with tape recorder in hand to interview any of those any of those uh, uh, angels about that. But um, that does seem to be the the implication and and maybe you know even part of the et- the etymology uh, here is that the guardianship is part of the the duty um uh of the watchers as the name w- would imply well let's uh, to be fair too let's at least acknowledge that in, at least scripturally yeah we we are, we've all read Enoch and and also find it very helpful but in terms of biblically Watchers appears only in Daniel 4, and the context is, you know, he he has a vision, and the watchers, holy ones, come down from heaven, and we know holy ones are synonymous with sons of God, which are synonymous with the heavenly host, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that connection. Uh, Sentences by the decree of the watchers, the holy ones. Mm. And so they have this sort of decretal presence in there. And then we connect that. I mean, most of us tend to connect that to uh, Daniel 9, is it, where, uh, or is it 10? Uh, where he uh, sees another being, or? The princes, the princes of the. Yeah, prince, prince, the prince of yeah, Egypt, yeah. or prince of Persia and prince of yeah. Greece. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's, I think there's a theological connection that we're making there uh, to some degree that maybe those princes, those sars, uh, princes of Egypt and Greece are co-equivalent to those watchers. But, you know, that definitely is a, a connection that's being made that's not necessarily explicit. Is that fair to say? It is, but I would I also so. add that it's, uh, it's virtually the universal view of the Jews at the time of the New Testament. They're, yep. they're all making that same conclusion. Sure. And you could probably make an argument I don't know how you'd do it exactly that some of the New Testament authors would take the same view, but, and if you could do that, then it would, it's, it's much stronger, but yeah. your point is well made that um, we can go to extra biblical texts all we want and you can learn a lot, but the Bible itself does talk about these things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And of course. Absolutely. Psalm 82 is the classic passage, right? You know? <laughs> Well, but I do think that there's a variety of interpretations of that passage. Um, <clears throat> one is, you know, uh, I do think that there is a, within those of us who do accept the watcher paradigm, as I call it, um, there's the question of, so in Psalm 82 and other p- passages, obviously Deuteronomy 32, right? Um, he apportioned the nations according to the sons of God. And the question is, were those good guys that went bad or did he give them to bad guys? You know, are they, are the watchers bad or did they go bad? And while Psalm 82 appears to, to, from, from one perspective, it appears to illustrate that 
oh, it looks like they're good and they've gone bad, right? God has taken his place in the council, divine gods, um, you know, uh, amongst, I'm sorry, amidst the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you show judge unjustly and show partiality? So they've been given this you know, responsibility to judge and they've been unjust about it. Um, and then he judges them. He says, I'm going to judge you. You are God's uh, sons of the most high. Nevertheless, you shall like men, you shall die. And um, so the question is there, on, you know, within one perspective, people will, will could argue, OK, that so he gives them over to good watchers who go bad. I'm of a different school. I don't think that's the case. Um, I think that these are fallen watchers of some kind, and it's more like Romans 1 where he's handing them over. It's like if you're going to keep worshiping idols at Babel, then I'm going to hand you over to those, the, to those false gods, so to speak. Uh, I think that you know, in the end, the, uh, it's the same result, certainly. Uh, and the question then becomes, okay, if they did fall, then when did they fall? And if, you look at the, if you're looking at the biblical text, they would have to have fallen pretty early on in in the whole process because of the way they're talking, you know, the way they're described. But that that might be something to discuss as well. L- let me throw out something that I think is really interesting. The uh, New English translation, which I, I like because the translators were gracious enough to include all of their notes, the translators notes and study notes. So you can look at what they were thinking when they made certain choices about uh, uh, how to render the Hebrew into into English. Psalm 82, oh. verse one Uh, In the ESV, God has taken his place in the divine council, which is where the term comes from. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. But the New English translators rendered it this way. God stands in the assembly of El. In the midst of the gods, he renders judgment. And their their comment is worth reading here. Let me bring up the uh, their note here. And of course, it's not going to link to it in my logos on my iPad just decided to get funky. But uh, the Hebrew term adat El means assembly of El. And if I can paraphrase what the translators from the New English translator, uh, New English, uh, the Net Bible wrote, it's that uh, what we've got here then is a polemic against these fallen angels, these fallen watchers, where God essentially invades the infernal council, if you will, and passes judgment on them. Which gives that a whole different thing. I mean, uh, you know, that's that's fascinating. I say say that again, Derek. That's uh, fascinating. In in this concept, in this concept, what the uh, what is in view here is that uh, Yahweh invades the infernal council, the Adat El, the assembly of El, and decrees judgment on them for ruling unjustly. Which what you're saying is that the, the assembly of El was a known Canaanite concept. Yeah. Yeah. Here, okay, now I brought it up. Here's what the translators of the New English translation nation said. In the Ugaritic myths, the phrase of Adit Ilim, and I forget my pronunciation, I don't speak Ugaritic, refers to the assembly of the gods who congregate in King Kirtu's house, where Baal asks El to bless Kirtu's house. If the Canaanite divine assembly is referred to here in Psalm 82, verse 1, then the psalm must be understood as a bold polemic against Canaanite religion. Israel's God, Yahweh, invades El's assembly denounces its gods as failing to uphold justice and, de- and announces their coming demise. So you've got a picture here of uh, basically war in the heavenlies. Then you compare this to like Psalm 68, where Yahweh is described as, uh, uh, you, you know, comparing the, the many peaked mountain, the mountain of Bashan with the mountain that God shows for his abode. Let me bring that up here. So I'm not uh, massacring the text. Beginning at verse 15, O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan. And Mike Heiser's pointed out that the uh, that verse Har Elohim can mean mountain of the gods because the mountain of God is actually Zion, not not Bashan, which is Hermon. Uh, Why do you look with hatred, O many peaked mountain at the mount that God desired for his abode? Yes, where Yahweh will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that uh, Yahweh God may dwell there. Um, It's a difficult passage to understand but again the net bible is really interesting where uh, that uh, sinai is now in the sanctuary they render um the lord comes from sinai in holy splendor sort of that uh, yahweh from the south motif so yeah, it's that's a notoriously difficult psalm to interpret but if you've got a divine council worldview in uh, in mind it almost reads as though it's describing a uh, <laughs> an assault in the spirit realm, God and his chariots going to Mount Hermon and taking captives away. 
Yeah. So my question was this, Derek. Like this is this is actually kind of why I wanted to have this. I I just could have a million questions. I think this could go on for weeks and weeks if we wanted it to. <laughs> but um, uh, my question is based on what you said for the net in verse one there. Um, is there a difference then between like, is there, are there two different assemblies? Would there be like a good assembly in heaven versus an evil assembly? Uh, Psalm 89 talks about the assembly in heaven. Right. And we also see that, that in first that Kings 22. Do you think that's what they're suggesting? Well, it, it's, it's possible. I mean, if they're talking about the dot L, the assembly of L as a separate, uh, uh, gathering, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, why wouldn't the fallen realm have its own council? Sure. Well, it, that's, it, I mean, it's yeah. that, that's very much to the purpose of the demonic realm anyway. I mean, what do they do? They, they take what's good, they turn it on its head and make a shadowy facsimile of it. Yeah, Sharon, yeah. Is, Sharon has joked about this, but I think she might be onto something here. She says they probably have their own prophecy conferences where the demons get together with their own little <laughs> graphs and charts and trying to figure out what Revelation and Daniel actually mean. You know, when are we, yeah. we going to strike? Because uh, this is what Yahweh says is going to happen, but uh, we've we got to figure out a way around it. But they got that Messiah thing wrong. They missed the Messiah verses. <laughs> Yeah, like Psalm 82, 8, the <laughs> classic Messiah verse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which fits into verse 1, you know. So that's kind of why I'm asking this, because I could see both both ways. I could see yeah. a fallen council with a, a deity named El, but also Scripture takes El, that title, and it applies it to the God of Israel. So, um you know, is he in the midst of that evil council or is there in uh, are there fallen beings that are on the council that's in heaven? OK, so so what, what we're seeing here then is this an explicit subversion, meaning they're, expl you know, the writer is explicitly uh, uh, describing the subversion that he's taking place or is it assumed? In other words, w you know, we often find the assumptions where it's just. You know, like uh, all the Baal language that's used of Yahweh, right, in, in, in uh, the Pentateuch. Um, you, know, you know, Yahweh rides the clouds. It doesn't, you know, by implication, it's assumed they're saying we're using Baal language because Yahweh's the storm god, not Baal. But they're not saying it explicitly, right? And so the qu you could see Psalm 82, you can interpret it as he's already subverted that paradigm and he's talking about his own assembly there is no assembly of l there's my assembly you know or what derek's saying is no there they could be literally literally the writer could be doing that literally which i i i'm open i i, I like you I, I i can see both working mm -hmm. and especially because i've studied subversion so much in the hebrew text or in the you know the, the old testament that you can see both of these approaches throughout the text it's possible well, yeah, and you, you would expect these uh, i'm sorry Doug, go ahead well i was i was just going to say because uh, i think it's related to psalm 82 my opinion is that psalm 82 a is you you cannot read it properly apart from psalm 2 8 uh, because they're both talking about the sun essentially in my mind the sun inheriting the nations Yes. Um, and, and Psalm 2 comes before Psalm 82. But the reason why that matters is because Psalm 82 or Psalm 2 is about these rulers uh, throwing their fists up in Yahweh's face and saying, we don't want to have anything to do with you. And I believe that the rulers there are every bit as much heavenly as they are kings of the earth. So anyway. I was just going to add to that, that, you know, I mean, in, in just in terms of, of literary format, let's let's remember the genre that we're also dealing with here. This is poetry, yeah. So uh, you know, there's there's even more impetus on the part of the author to uh, to take those kinds of literary licenses, so to speak. You know, to um, you know, because that was as popular as literature could be at the time. Those that that kind of phraseology would have been known amongst the the people that could read it. Just like Leviathan, you know, Leviathan's yeah. all over Psalms, and it's, you know, it's just clearly re reinterpreted within their own paradigm, you know. But I think, D Doug, what you're, what you're saying, that's, an, that's a fascinating point because, again, those of us who do embrace the Watcher paradigm uh, or the Divine Council understanding, we now see passages that we didn't see before because mm -hmm. they're – because we know that they assumed yeah. that earthly leaders 
had over them heavenly leaders and they were connected. So whatever happened in earth happened in heaven as above, so below, right? So because they had that paradigm, then when you read Psalm 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together, uh-huh. fighting uh-huh. the Lord and his anointed. Uh-huh. You're right. I mean, like we, we, you know, from our viewpoint where we, you could say we're, we're reading, I don't, I don't want to be, we are reading into it, but because it's more explicit elsewhere, it's fair that we would read kings and rulers could include those above as well as those below. I but guess. Let me add one more to that, Brian, because I, you know, when I teach this to people in the most basic way that I can do it, I start really with Deuteronomy 32, 8. And because I believe verse nine is actually the primordial verse that moves into Psalm two and Psalm 82. And people talk about verse eight all the time with the divine council because the sons of God are receiving their inheritance. But the next verse talks about, but Yahweh gets Jacob as his allotment. Yes. And what, what, what that has to mean in my mind is that Yahweh there has got to be the son. Has to be, because it's the sons that are inheriting. And if that's true, then that stands as the first verse that's behind the greater uh, inheritance, which after the nation of Israel, in Psalm 2, he ends up inheriting all the nations. And then, you know, in Psalm 82 is kind of the climax of that. So I, I actually think that there's a whole host of passages that are really speaking to the same thing. I like it. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And what, one of the things that uh, really, uh, again, another jaw drop moment uh, was uh, in, in reading the work of, of Nicholas Wyatt, who's a professor emeritus at uh, University of Edinburgh, who's written a lot about this. And uh, he he and his son Simon wrote uh, an article some it was just a few years ago called The Long Durée of the Beef Business, uh, which is about the bull imagery in uh, among the gods in ancient Mesopotamia and the Levant. And he, he's pointed out in a couple of articles now that um, there are a couple of passages in the Old Testament that may make more sense as other references to El, the chief God or the creator God of the Canaanites, than the way they're typically translated in our English Bibles. And uh, the, the main passage here is Hosea 8, verse, verses 5 and 6, uh, which is uh, Hosea... Uh, condemning the the golden calves set up by Jeroboam at uh, Bethel and Dan. Verse 5, I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For it is from Israel. A craftsman made it. It is not God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. Wyatt has pointed out, based on the work of another scholar prior to Wyatt, that um, the phrase, for it is from Israel, is uh, actually in Hebrew, literally, for from Israel. And the verse that we have, the way it's been translated into English for us is, is an assumption by the translators to try to make sense of it for it is from Israel instead of for from Israel. But it's been pointed out that if you regroup the consonants, that verse actually reads for it is bull L, which was his main epithet at the creator God of the Canaanites for it is bull L, a craftsman made it. It is not God. And that would fit given that uh, the proximity in, in the northern kingdom to Mount Hermon, especially with the, the golden calf at Dan, um, venerating the creator God of the Canaanite pantheon. Um, th- there's another verse, too. You can also do that in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, the number of the sons of Bull El instead of the number of sons of Israel. But that's based on the Masoretic. But Hosea 8, 6 here seems to make sense, more sense as for it is Bull El. A craftsman made it uh, given the, the and if you've got a divine council worldview, you can see how that makes sense. But uh, most of us were raised in churches, not really understanding that or being taught that. And once again, we have lost the connection with the network. Missouri. Oh, yeah, that's right. There we oh, are. He's back. He's You're back. back. We got you. <laughs> Just about 20 seconds off. OK, well, it, it recorded on my side, so it's fine. <laughs> Oh, okay. okay. Good deal. I just kept talking to cover. Well, we're, talking, we're talking while we were doing. <laughs> so, anyway, the 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 bottom line here is that uh, because of the uh, uh, the consonantal nature of Hebrew, um, scholars uh, translating our English Bibles have made some assumptions about what that verse meant. Uh, where it uh, actually, it seems to me that uh, rendering it as uh, Dr. Wyatt suggests, for it is bull L, uh, Hosea 
eight six makes more sense. No complaint from me. Okay. Yeah, I, I I'd agree with I'd agree with that. Makes sense. Now, so let me ask a question uh, about maybe kind of change the subject a little bit. Go back to some of these earlier guys, and I, I kind of want to do it with Azazel. And I know Derek's been looking into this quite a bit. Well, Judd more so than me. But... Think, well, you guys have all looked into it, frankly. So let's let's kind of take the storyline and let's see. Take the Enoch just for what it is, and you've got Enoch as kind of one of the two main instigators of the whole pre-flood uh, sons of God Nephilim thing. And then he is judged, right? And he is locked away. Is that correct? Yeah. In the- Dude, yeah, he's thrown into Dudal. He's thrown, he's basically thrown into Tataris in the Peter version of it, right? Okay. And then they're locked away for 70 versions, which is this, uh, you know, uh, um, perfect number uh, representing uh, the end of the age. But then you come to Leviticus, and all of a sudden that guy shows up at the Day of Atonement. So does that imply to you guys that somehow there's a – the way I look at it with the binding of Satan from my millennial view is that it's kind of a house arrest. Um, but he still is able to kind of work his kingdom. So how, how, would, how would you guys explain a pre-flood watcher like Azazel being bound, and then all of a sudden his appearance – in Leviticus and how important it was for like the very central part of the Torah on, which is the day of atonement. I think, uh, I'll take a crack at that one. Um, I, I've made the analogy before, um, probably in conversations with both you and Derek. Um, I'm not sure if I've talked about it with Brian, but, um, to me, it's almost analogous to the way that, you know, if you lock up a kingpin, you know, they're still able to control their crew, you know, the, the politics of their organization outside of, of the prison that they're incarcerated in. And I think that there may be something similar to that at play here in, in certain, but even if that's not the case, the legacy of, of these entities and the, the from from not just the cultural engineering on humanity, but also the sort of supernatural religious engineering that they did was such that other entities in their wake uh, took up that mantle. And, and so you may have, I, I think either either scenario or some of both uh, may certainly be possible, but they're certainly in the case of uh, Azazel and uh, Peneus at the foot of Mount Hermon, there, there is a veritable train of of goat deities, beginning with with Azazel, uh, who, whose name you know contains that that morpheme odds or odds that means goat, uh, going all the way to uh, uh, not just Pan, but even beyond that. There, there are some some identities and entities that carry on uh, those those kinds of, of concepts amongst uh, uh, later groups, even the, even the Muslims and the Druzes that settle uh, at uh, Peneus. Azazel, um, in, in Leviticus 16, uh, 16, yeah, Levit- Leviticus 16 is what uh, Doug is referring to, the, uh, the Day of Atonement where uh, the, the sin of the tribe, the sin of the, the people was put on the, the, uh, the goat and the scapegoat and then sent out into the the wilderness for Azazel. Uh, this this represents the the uh, idea that uh, the wilderness, that the desert, was the location of of demons, um, which uh, I, I think is interesting. I, and I agree with Judd, and I think that's a that's a good way of looking at it. You know, how is it that somebody who's a, a mob boss can still control what's happening on the streets while he's locked up in prison? I, I think they've still got access to their demonic minions, their children, essentially, who. Uh, communicate back and forth between Tartarus and the, uh, and the, the surface world. But um, th- this idea that uh, the wilderness is a, is a place where inhabited by demons. And, and we read in Leviticus also that uh, the Israelites were condemned by God for sacrificing to uh, these goat demons, the Seirim in, in the desert. Um, 
that kind of gives it a whole new spin when you think about it to the verse in Isaiah that is uh, repeated by John the Baptist, you know, make straight in the wilderness a path, you know, um, it's like I'd never really thought about that before. Uh, a voice crying in the wilderness. No, is the, the voice is crying, make straight a path in the wilderness for God, you know, for the Messiah. Like, oh, OK, this is another aspect of, uh, you know, God reclaiming territory from the enemy. You make a connection, uh, at least to some degree, between uh, you guys say Azazel and I say Azazel. Yeah, I don't so know what why is that it? Is. Do we have P- any potato, potato? <laughs> Judd, do you have the the proper <laughs> linguistic prof, uh, pro- professional <laughs> knowledge to tell us that it's Azaz- <laughs> as a, as Azazel? I may be too influenced by the Smurfs. Isn't there? Isn't like the bad guy like really close to that? <laughs> That's o- Osriel. <laughs> he's named after the angel of death. Right. And, and if you read the more modern translations of Enoch, Enoch, it's actually Azael. There's no second yeah, Azael. 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 But seriously, yeah. like in the Greek or something, is there a a way of saying it properly? Um, it's it's probably closer to what Derek just said, Azazel, with the oh. The consonant marking, because it's more, well, it's more similar to the uds or uds that you find as a variant to that as well. Okay. Um, so it probably is Azazel. But, All right. I got you know, the Logos, I got Logos Bible software. and Well, we'll, like, get, the, we'll, we'll get the definitive answer now. Yeah. Well, at least from their Hebrew scholars. And it does say, let's see here. If I select the, the word and I go to pronounce, it says Azazel. Azazel. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I would think that the emphasis would be on the uh, would be on L. I would think all these deities are some some aspects or some relationship to L. Mm-hmm. So we're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Uh, That's uh, correct, Amundo. Yes, <laughs> it's Isaiah forty. So I, the verse I was looking for is Isaiah forty verse three. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So if we connect this to this idea that the wilderness was the, the haunt of demons. This Isaiah here, which is, again, is, is cited by John the Baptist in the New Testament. Um, you're making a highway yeah. right through the enemy territory for yeah. God. And, and Isaiah 13 talks about the destruction of Babylon. And it talks about, um, you know, it will not be inhabited for generations, but the wild animals will die down there, the howling creatures. And, of course, the the different translations don't capture the the Hebrew, but these ostriches and wild goats and hyenas will dance and cry and jackals. But if you look into the Hebrew behind it, these are these demonic references to demo- demons and such. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Shady, shady. Reading the Azazel passage in Leviticus 16, I actually I have not interpreted it myself as something as um, anything more than another subversive element, meaning I can't see like when it says, you know, one goat is for Yahweh to make atonement and the other one sent into the wilderness to Azazel or Azaz. Az- oh gosh, now you got me going. I'm just going to say Azazel. You guys can say whatever you want. Um, so I've never understood that. I've never seen that as being, a equivalent sacrifice or gift or anything like that, because that would be repugnant. You know, in other words, I can't imagine Yahweh saying, Oh, you know, give this, you know, the sins that go on this goat and send them to Azazel, like the other goat is for me. I don't see it the same way because that would mm-hmm. seem to be repugnant to, to the theology of it. So I've seen it more as a, in the same way that Azazel was consumed in Dudael, the desert, which is a symbol of chaos, mm. and it represents evil and chaos and et cetera. And that's where Azazel goes. So when I put the sins on the goat, it's, I get the one goat that's for a sacrifice to me, but the other goat goes off into the chaos, meaning your sins are, are I put your sins into the chaos. So in other words, Azazel, I've seen Azazel, and you guys can correct me if, if you have a different way of seeing this, but I've seen Azazel as the, you know, the symbolic reference to everything that that chaos world represents. And they see him as part of that, but not so much that it's going to him personally, but that he is that, in this passage, he's that symbolic representation of the chaos where your sins will go. I don't know. That's that's how I've seen it. So that's why I've, I haven't seen it as this, 
as it's going to or Azazel is in Tartarus and he's able to do something or anything like that. Yeah, it's not a sacrifice. I'd agree with that. It's it's no, not it's a def- sacrifice yep. to Azazel. Yeah. It's it's a, yeah. it's a it's a it's a token. It's a, 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 a it's a way to remember. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, if you're just looking at this in anthropological terms, think what a vivid part of that that ritual uh, that the the Azazel goat would be. I mean, you there's no way that you would forget all of the the tradition yeah. uh, and the story behind that was something like that so it's definitely not a sacrifice but whereas you have the the sacrifice to Yahweh it's a it's a token remembrance well so your your answer then Brian would be quite different it would be uh, it would seem that him being locked away would be he really was locked away and he's he's done and all they're doing is remembering something and or at least look I would have always be open to discussing the variations uh, of, of ideas but I would say more that I don't see this passage as necessarily supporting. If, if there's something else that does, fine. But I guess I've just never seen this passage as being a reference to uh, Azazel as having something, uh, some kind of ability trapped away in Tartarus. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would just push back and say uh, it, it seems from the language – to me, that Azazel is somehow present. I mean, it's not saying uh, send out a sacrifice for the memory of that old sucker that was locked away. Um, he seems, you know, send it f- for Azazel. And I, I, I do think you could get where you're where you're going, but I don't know that it's necessary to do that. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's an interesting, interesting way of looking at it. It is interesting that uh, in the Book of Enoch, Azazel or Azael and uh, Shemiyaza almost have, it's almost like a dual storyline there where you've got uh, Shemiyaza who's described as the leader of this group, yeah. the chief of the watchers, yeah. but Azael it has all of the sin ascribed to him for all of this forbidden knowledge. So you've got uh, on the one hand, yeah. the story of the, uh, the, the mixing of the human bloodline with the divine. And then the second story in Azael being responsible for all of this uh, forbidden knowledge. He's, uh, he's sort of like a Prometheus character. Well, I was just yeah. going to ask you that because I know that you connect uh, in some way Prometheus to him. Uh, and I was wondering specifically about the myth of Prometheus where, you know, he, he has to be have his liver pecked away. And then he wakes up in the morning and it's all back to the what it was. And then it happens again. And then it happens again. And it happens again and again. Uh, do you see any kind of relationship to that myth with what we're talking about with Azazel in the desert? Or are they totally separate? Well, I think that's a fake news version, like most of the pagan stories that we get from Greece, Rome, Canaan, Mesopotamia, to explain why this uh, entity who brought us all this great knowledge that uh, we use to make our lives better is no longer around. We got to deal with these little demonic minions. Uh, I think it's the same reason that um, we, we get the stories of uh, of uh, the, the overthrow of the sky god by uh, the the creator god, uh, El, uh, or uh, Kronos, Saturn, um, uh, Enlil, you know, overthrowing the sky god, Kumarbi in the Hurrian pantheon. Uh, they, they, they've got to explain why the sky god, who I argue is a fake news pagan religion version of Yahweh. This explains why he's no longer here and dealing with us on a one-to-one basis. He was driven away. And what's more, he's been emasculated because he was castrated in many of those myths. But then, you know, the, the Enlil, uh, by the time you get to the, uh, the biblical period, Enlil is now in the underworld, one of the Anunnaki. Uh, El is ruling from the, the two deeps. Um, and the storm god has taken over, you know, uh, Saturn, Kronos, Baal Haman, they're all connected to the underworld. Dagon, Molech, all of the various identities worn by this, uh, this character. I think the same thing is you know, with Prometheus and Azael. I think it's just a fake news version to explain why this particular entity is no longer walking among us. Oh, yeah, that evil god over there, Zeus, uh, has punished him for giving us fire. Uh, again, just sort of a fake news version to explain the, the current state of affairs in the spirit realm. Well, and there, there are other titans that, that bear similarity to Azazel as well. So you're getting me tripped up now, too. Um, <laughs> Here's our rule, guys. You can say it any way you want. <laughs> we're, just, we're having all kinds of linguistic gymnastics tonight. Um, but the, there's another uh, 
a titan named uh, Pallas, P-A-L-L-A-S, uh, who is also uh, associated with Warcraft, who was very savage, and um, uh, uh, the, the Greeks conceptualized Pallas as having goat-like features. Um, huh. So they're... You know, we may be looking at a, you know, in in terms of the way that it that it gets sort of put through the uh, the Greek meat grinder. Say that ten times fast. Hmm. Uh, that may we may be getting a, a conglomeration uh, of, of different titans uh, in one uh, Watcher identity. Hmm. Just throwing that out as a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to do some digging in it, because it wasn't one of the epithets of Athena, Pallas Athena? Yes, that's right. Um, and I'm trying to remember the connection there, but yeah, Pallas, Pallas Athena. Um, there's something about uh, 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 he's uh, he, he was flayed because he tried to, to rape somebody. It may have been Athena. Mm-hmm. Um, and his hide was made into a shield uh, that I believe was given to Athena, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe some relation between his name and uh, and the word for uh, brandishing is in brandishing the spear. So yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Hmm. But uh, you guys, I've seen the movie Eternals, and that's not the way they show it. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to see that one. I've heard oh, wonderful I mean, reviews. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it's fascinating because it is a, you know, this secular version of the Watcher motif, which is yeah. kind of interesting. Did you write a review of it, Brian? No, um, unfortunately, I have not. I Are haven't been to? writing too many. Re- I haven't been writing any reviews for a couple of years. Yeah, I know. I but I love what you do. You need to. I get. I need to get back to it. But. Uh, it's what's cool though is it is kind of cool because they're trafficking in our in our area there and it's mm-hmm. sort of okay these people are doing some research on they're finding something similar and uh it, in a way it's kind of making our um our arguments those of us who believe in the divine council and the watcher paradigm you know we're we're considered fringe by certain elements of uh, of the Christian world as well as the secular world, right? Because what we're saying is crazy stuff. But this, this stuff like Eternals and Wonder Woman are making it much more reasonable, which is kind of good. You know, because yeah. the whole thing in in the first Wonder Woman movie was just you know the the god of war was was there on Earth and they're fighting him and and he had a distinct very much of a watcher sort of uh, power about his influence and such. Mm-hmm. And so at least it makes it uh, that, that, that pagan storytelling of Hollywood is at least making, making some sense of the paradigm that we're trying to communicate. If that makes sense, it's not as wild and crazy out of nowhere uh, to people. Yeah. And, and more people are, you know, because of that, they're they're ready to have those kind of conversations. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the, the ground's already primed for us. I mean, let's face it, because Hollywood, they don't believe these religions. They use the religions as humanistic um, right. uh, paradigms, imagination in order to communicate their humanistic views. Right. But the point is, is that, like you say— and the, they they show it out of context or in a very distorted, warped you know context, and so there is certainly that danger that connects to it. I think. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Uh, uh, Doug, you again, you wrote the book Giants, Sons of God, uh, Sons of the Gods, uh, some years ago, about seven eight years ago now. Uh, you're the only one who has a pulpit here, where you're actually preaching to a congregation. What uh, has your congregation? How have they responded to this? And how has this uh, storytelling by Hollywood uh, helped or hindered uh, you getting this message across? Um, well, I would say both. What Hollywood is doing and, you know, the last 20 months has done nothing but help <laughs> be able to yes. talk about what's right. going on because people are, are, I think, because of both those things and probably some other factors, too, I think supernatural eyes are starting to be opened in a way that I have not seen in my lifetime uh, with people. And, you know, the work that all of you guys are doing is contributing, I think, a, a lot more than any of you may realize to 
helping people be able to see something that we've just kind of lost. And, you know, I've had, I first came across uh, Mike's stuff back when he was doing the myth that is true and, and uh, giving it out for free and still doing all yeah. those, those things. And that's yeah. really, I think when I met Brian, yeah. Uh, so I've had a long time, probably a dozen years to really talk through this with my congregation. And I, I don't shy away from it. And what you know, I just I'm a guy who preaches through books of the Bible one verse at a time and just go through them. And what you do when when you what you find when you do that is that this stuff comes up way more than people could ever possibly imagine. Yeah. And so I, you know, I make sure that I take the time to walk people through it. Uh, probably more deliberately than other topics, just because it's what's been on my mind for so long. But um, most of them have received it pretty well. And uh, what I find is that when they're finally able to make that first connection to something, you know, I always thought I believed in the supernatural. But what you're saying makes me think maybe I was like a, a total materialist or something, because what you're saying just completely blows me away. <laughs> And it just it's so helpful for them to be able to I look at it as adding a third dimension to our life. You know, the, the supernatural hasn't done anything to change my basic confessional theology and what I am is a reformed pastor, a Baptist pastor. But what it has done is it's uh, elevated me up, you know, vertically uh, to be able to think and see things that uh, I couldn't see before. I just didn't have the paradigm. And that's that's the way the vast majority of people that I teach this to also um, that's what they communicate to me. So it can be done. It's not easy. Have and you, you have to be wise in how you t teach it can be done. It really can. Have you had um, congregants come and challenge you and say, let's go out for coffee and talk about this stuff? Or uh, a little bit. Uh, I don't think that I would say that I really had anybody leave directly the church because of it, although – it's made some pretty uncomfortable. And over time, I think they come up with other reasons that they just can't deal with it anymore, which is fine. I mean, I understand where I understand that it's hard to deal with. But um, when you're confronted with it in book after book after book and chapter after chapter after chapter, you really have to. If you're an honest Christian, you have to deal with it. Have to. I hear something very similar from uh, yeah. Ty Tyler Gilreath, who has written a book uh, recently that draws on the same material called uh, Gods Over Gospel, or Gospel Over Gods, rather. Uh, and he pastors down in um, Alabama and has gone through this sort of the same discovery, but more recently, and uh, has uh, had a few that, that have challenged him on it. But uh, for the most part, when you start going through the Bible and, and showing verse by verse, uh, this is what this means. Uh, when the Bible says God stands in the midst of gods, it's, you know, that's what it really means. When he, in Exodus twelve twelve, when he says he's going to execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt, he's not talking about their idols. So um, right. it, it, it brings the Bible alive in a way that it just wasn't before. That's uh, what really drew Sharon and me into this when we stumbled across uh, Mike Heiser's work back in, I think, 2004. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. I stumbled on. The myth that is true when it was on, like online, yep. three quarters written, just free for everybody. And I'm like, what is this stuff? This is really wild. Yeah. And and it's like and that was the thing that was the book that I mean, obviously, I, I I'm, I'm a footnote reader, as I know all you guys are. So when I read that book, I also read all the footnotes and the pop papers and stuff. But that was the thing that transformed because I, too, come from a reform background. So and and it's, you know, very you know, uh, God is in control type of thing. And so you tend to, even though you believe the Bible says, talks about angels and demons, I won't deny that. I believe it. But you tend to have a paradigm that's more, well, God, since God's in control, he's sort of doing it all. And you don't, you, so you, 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 you don't see that stuff that's there. And when you, when you finally face the passage or the, you know, the, the scriptures and what it's saying, it's like, wow, yeah. I've claimed to be supernatural in my mindset, but I, I was not as much as I thought I was. And it affected me so much that that's what launched, you know, my 15, 16 book series, because it's like, well, now if I'm, I'm now reading all these stories through a different uh, paradigm and I'm seeing, and it's, it's so fascinating, so cool that I want to share that. And then that's what launched the, you know, Chronicles of Nephilim and stuff. But I, I, I feel like, um, that's the that's one of the benefits of the storytelling aspect is it puts flesh on our theological arguments that we're making here 
in a way that people then can see the, re-see those Bible stories in that fresh light. And, and I too have gotten many people writing me, you know, and, and telling me how it's changed their, they've, a lot of people have said, you know, I feel like I had a deadened view of the Bible. It was just boring. It's gotten boring over the years, you know, as a Christian, but you get, you help make it come alive again. I'm reading the scriptures more and I'm seeing it through fresh eyes. And again, I, you know, I also point back to Mike Kaiser as, as one of the key influences of me on that. But, but uh, yeah, this, this supernatural view is, is definitely something that works against my natural tendency. (laughs) Yeah. You and me both. I I think for me, it really, Mm -hmm. Uh, the first time I heard Mike was about 2002. Uh, I, I remember I was in I was in grad school working on my my anthropology degree, and that was kind of the the flashpoint for me the the laying of the black powder <laughs> before it was ignited uh, was undoubtedly my 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 first expedition where I I, I helped excavate uh, Panaeus. Where I was actually working at the foot of Mount Hermon, and I, you know, the, in the weeks leading up to that, um, one of my professors had said something about this uh, apocryphal stuff that dealt with, you know, the Genesis six material, and I found everything, everything that I possibly could, not not just on Peneus and its history and and the theological implications, uh, but I. I spent all my spare change on making copies of stuff at the library from all the, all the Dead Sea Scroll material. Uh, and it, it completely changed the hue of that, that, uh, that trip. I had initially just gone to learn the rudiments of scientific archaeology and it turned into something quite different, you know, actually working there day after day in the shadow of this. And you're just like, Am I in a Lord of the Rings story? I mean, this is like, this is ground zero right here. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I owe Mike a debt of gratitude for helping to string together some things and for sure. Well, I think we all do. I, I mean, so his, his willingness. About thinking about, nope. The thing so interesting to me about thinking about Mike that he's, he's influenced all of us so deeply is – First, you can go back before him to plenty of people that were talking about this. And really, I mean, I think that's really hugely important. In fact, you can go way back into the church fathers and into the Jews themselves. And um, really all he's done, and he's done it in a way that is just uniquely gifted, is to be able to take scholarship and make it accessible to normal people. And what's happened from that um, with the popularity that he's received and his He's so smart about the way that he markets himself is that he's got a lot of really intelligent people to listen to him, but not to parrot him, but rather to really internalize that worldview and then take it in their own directions that they have been gifted with themselves. And I think that's what's so fascinating about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Agreed. So in the the last segment here, why don't we uh, speculate a little bit of what the – the the fallen realm these these principalities powers cosmic rulers over this present darkness hope to achieve i mean the bible's pretty clear that uh, at the end of all of it god wins and they're still dead to paraphrase mike uh, how do they expect to uh get get out from under the sentence proclaimed in psalm 82 and why <laughs> i guess as a sort of a, a sub question to consider why do we Christians assume that the only enemy, supernatural enemy we face is Satan and all of these other gods <laughs> don't really exist? They're just all made up. Let me take that last question and just throw this one past you guys. I'm not quite sure what to do with his entire history. I, you know, I do believe the New Testament tells us that Satan is the character in the garden. Yeah. And I know the speculators, all kinds of different guys that, that fit that bill, including Azazel is one of them. But um Let's just go with the character Satan and let's say that, uh, you know, kind of set aside uh, the Satan of Job and all that kind of stuff just for for this discussion that that he's this guy in the Old Testament. He's the guy that was in the garden. You move forward to the New Testament and there's evidence that the Jews actually saw that particular entity as the God of Rome. So going back to um, Daniel 10, 
Um, there's the Prince of Persia. There's the Prince of Greece. There's there's the Prince of Rome. And this person is the Prince of Rome. And so that would mean in the New Testament context that he is the ruler of the world at that point in time. If you went back to an early point in time, it probably would have been somebody else. But it just so happens to be that he becomes the ruler. And um, so I think it's probably I think the explanation of why we just kind of default to Satan has more to do with a literary device than anything else. It's really a metonymy. So Satan becomes representative of everything, but we don't realize that that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so we just kind of default that he's kind of the only fallen spiritual being that really matters that we need to worry about, even though we know in our heads that that's not true. And then when you combine that with the fact that we just have lost any kind of an understanding of a, a distinction between idols and gods, first and second commandment, um, that they're not the same thing, that there actually are real entities beyond him. Well, it's kind of a perfect storm. So it's no wonder that, that we collapse them all into him. Mm-hmm. I opened a can of worms on Facebook by uh, posting the episode that Sharon and I recorded for Unraveling Revelation a few weeks ago, and where we declared that uh, Lucifer is not Satan. Um arguing that in Isaiah 14, there's no, and I'm open to the idea that I could be wrong about this, but there's nothing in Isaiah 14 or the parallel chapter, Ezekiel 28, that connects the Satan of the Old Testament to uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, it puts him in the garden, but doesn't say that he was responsible for the uh, temptation that led Adam and Eve astray into the fall of humanity. Um, There's also no, uh, in the other references of the Satan in the Old Testament, no, uh, uh, a connection to the underworld. He still got access to the throne of God. Whereas Isaiah 14 throws this entity down to Sheol and um, connects him to the Rephaim, the spirits of the Nephilim. So, you know, I, I'm just throwing that out there, just suggesting that, uh, Hey, maybe there's another fallen angel in view here. Uh, but uh, that's not what we've been taught. And it's really interesting seeing the reaction of some folks who just take that as, Oh, that's heresy. Lucifer is Satan. Yeah. Well, but yeah. but why? Why why do we you know okay? I mean we we you know why? <laughs> yeah, the, Isaiah 14 and what is it? Uh Ezekiel 20, 28. 6 28. Yeah. Those are the two that all throughout, you know, a, a lot of evangelical history, those are assumed to be about Satan and his fall, etc. And yeah, I too no longer see it in in those terms. Um so there's definitely uh plenty of us who are uh, questioning that, you know. What's really intriguing, too, is that Ezekiel 28, because this is the other thing that always puzzled me, was uh, how could he be a cherub, the guardian cherub who covers, and he's described as a nakash. Is a nakash a cherub? Because the cherub doesn't have any serpentine features. It's a bull, ox, eagle, man. But uh, the Septuagint says that uh, in Ezekiel 28, this, this rebel was not the guardian cherub. He was there in the garden with the guardian cherub, who the then throws cherub. him yeah. out. Yep. Interesting. And that fits the, ad, uh, 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 would you say that that's part of the Adam view then? The view that that's talking about Adam? Uh, no, I, I think Ezekiel 28 is referring to another uh, entity entirely. Gotcha. Now, I argue gotcha. in my new book that it's Shemiyaza, but um, w- w- Ezekiel 28 also describes that, you know, you've got all of these jewels that are cover- covering you. And those jewels are the same ones, essentially, that uh, were in the ephod worn by the high priest. So is this entity, this other rebel, not Satan? This uh, Helel ben Shakar was he the high priest in Eden? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, again, just a thought. The Bible doesn't tell us, so we can't make a declarative, definite statement there. But uh, um, just interesting to oh. s- consider that there, there may be more, more, ad- more at work behind the scenes here than we've been taught. Right, and but it seems pretty. You know, it seems pretty strong. It's a pretty strong argument that. Uh, Satan is not really what's being talked about in both of these passages. Mm-hmm. However, you're going to interpret it. The assumption that it does is an assumption. Right. <laughs> but if you challenge my assumption, you're a heretic. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's time, to, uh, time to convene another ecumenical council. So then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do they think, regardless of who leads this? I mean, because it's pretty clear by the time of Revelation, uh, the Revelation uh, suggests that this entity, uh, Satan, is kind of the leader of the rebellion. And Jesus, in fact, when he's challenged in Matthew 12, uh, you're, you're casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, Baal the prince. And uh, Jesus says, if Satan's casting out demons by his own power, how will his kingdom stand? So by the New Testament period, 
this is something we don't see in the Old Testament, but by the New Testament, Jesus says Satan has a kingdom. So how does he figure he's going to get out of this uh, death sentence? Any so thoughts? My mind is just, is going to Bueller, sub question. Bueller, yeah. anybody? Yeah. Bueller? Yeah, my mind's <laughs> <Bueller's sub question. laughs> and I've thought a little bit about it. I'll throw it by you guys. And if you think I'm wrong, then you're a heretic. But uh, <laughs> I think that there's reason to think that the character Satan is actually Zeus, who is actually Baal. And so we actually do see him in the Old Testament. In fact, he's the major uh, evil player of the Old Testament. They're all the same entity. The reason I think that is because if he's the prince of Rome, you know, by the time Rome comes, who's who's the who's the leader of the Roman pantheon? It's Zeus. He's mm-hmm. the one that's over him. Yeah. And then you go back to Greece, and it's just kind of a connect the dots sort of thing. But it doesn't answer your question. But unless it, you know, I, I bring it up because okay, go ahead. Uh, unless the Satan. Ha Satan in uh, Job and uh, Zechariah 4 is actually another angel who just holds that office of being the adversary or the accuser in the Old Testament period. Sure. sure. Yeah, that's just an office, and I have mm-hmm. no problem with that. And that, that office could be held by Satan or it could be held by a whole bunch of different people. Jed, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, Did, isn't there a reference in the Dead Sea Scrolls that uh, there are a, a prayer to for, for Yahweh to protect against the Satans, multiple Satans? Uh, I believe so. The exact chapter and verse is escaping me, but I think that's right. That's a mind-blowing thing. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing we see in Revelation is this uh, mystery battle on the Scarlet Woman, who is... Um, used for a while and turned on. Uh, can we assume from that that uh, not all of these entities in the fallen realm, and Brian, I think I know where your answer is because I've read your books, uh, that these fallen <laughs> a- angels aren't all playing on the same team? I, I, but I, I'll let Brian jump in in a second, but I, I, Doug and I talked about this a little bit the other night, um, that uh, the while all of these entities are constrained, you know, under covenant laws, essentially, um, you know, they've got leashes that they operate on. In other words, uh, their 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 own personal politics and motivations may vary from entity to entity. Um, you know, even though in, in, in let's just say in, on certain quote unquote missions, they would have to fall in line, you know, with the hierarchy, uh, but they're they're you know, there's no way to know for sure, you know, how many clicks or cabals within, you mm-hmm. know, this hierarchy there are. And so their mot- motivations may vary somewhat from, from entity to entity. Yeah, you know, this is this is something that the, the process of, of writing the fiction for me helped me see it freshly. Uh, what was already actually in the Bible, but I didn't quite catch it, and that was... We we have this we have this sort of um, uh, context that I think assumption of evil you know based on our movies and our novels and stories or whatever that like evil is this 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 monolithic thing you know maybe there's maybe Satan's the lord of it all and but whatever it's just like that evil is this united army that's out to 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 accomplish its evil against us but the notion here is the assumption is deep that they're united and you know in order to write a good story you know you have to have conflict but uh and so when when I'm like okay uh, what is this watcher paradigm? What does it look like? You know, and this uh, I'm brought back to one of the original in the very beginning of this discussion, the mafia thing. Right. And I was thinking, well, you know, I saw it as like a mafia thing. Well, if these, these leaders of nations, it's kind of like the mafia where, yeah, there's a certain unity um, uh, amongst them, but if they are created beings with wills, right. That are, are their own. Why wouldn't they be like every other evil person, which is, yeah, I'll go along with this big plan against good, but I've got my own ideas, you know? I, I want this and I want that. And so why wouldn't they be jockeying for power over each other? And of mm-hmm. course, this isn't just, uh, I, I would argue that, that so, so my revelation was, wow, there's actually quite a fascinating possibility of them contesting within each other while they're also you know, going for this goal of fighting against Yahweh and his people. 
Um, but it wasn't just made up in my mind because in truth, that's what's in Daniel, right? That the Prince of Persia against the Prince of Greece. Mm-hmm. It's literally in the text that there, that these, and, 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 but it's also within the worldview that, okay, if there are principalities and powers over nations or kings or rulers, right, then when they are in conflict on earth, there's conflict in heaven. Well, of course, then those mm-hmm. entities are also going to be in conflict, even though they're evil. And, uh, yeah, so that was a, a revelation that I, 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 it really helped me to see, to see things differently, and I think more realistically. And that's what a lot of people have told me as well, as, as well as that. Yeah, you know, I never thought of it that way, but that makes a lot of sense. It's like politics, theopolitics. Yeah, theopolitics. yeah politics. A, a contemporary. I got to be really careful how I talk about this. I don't want to get in trouble, but, um, <laughs> you know, I just, so just from my, my, my way of viewing what's happened the last 20 months and my understanding of it, I've, I've spent way too much time thinking about it just because it's so overwhelming to everybody. And I, you know, I want to have answers for myself and I need to try and have answer for my people, but you know, I've come to believe that there's a real war going on. Um, and I think that that war is probably taking place on multiple levels. You got certainly an earthly level. And I think China probably has something, a uh, little something to do with that. But I also believe that there's a supernatural war going on and kind of the deeper you dig into this and you start looking into kind of the human sacrifice and stuff that I know that we're all we're all comfortable enough knowing that that's true and happening. If you if you were to say assign a deity to that just for sake of discussing it and trying to think about it and you put like Molech to that or Baphomet, whatever, whoever they are, um, this is this is a dark, dark evil. Now, the way most people talk about this is they go, okay, well, there's a side that there's a side of light. It's almost like uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, Children of Light, Children of Darkness sort of stuff. Sons of Light, Sons of Darkness. Like that's all there is. And so, well, of course, the people who are fighting this, they're they're on God's side. They're these are Yahweh's people. He's he's you know, they're in league with the Lord. He's he's got this thing. He's he's the one fighting the evil. Now, you know, being a reform guy, I certainly believe God's sovereign over all of that. Um, but what if, you know, what if what we had going on was something a little different? So what if we had these people, they're not worshiping um, Molech, but they're worshiping Virgo or something like that? My mind goes back to Plato where he really has a, it's an almost exact parallel to Deuteronomy 32, 8. In, in fact, Justin Martyr and others have suggested that Plato through Solon actually had contact with the Jews and that probably he ripped this off from Moses. <laughs> <laughs> and so when he yeah. talks about how and this is Plato, he's talking about how the gods, you know, had their various allotments given to them. And he says, well, Greece, we had Athena and Hephaestus. And these were the gods that were given to beauty and wisdom and philosophy, you know, and you can hear just pride welling up in him that, these are the gods that are over us, and they are not like that evil Molech. And I, you know, it's almost like he would say those two gods would be so disgusted by Molech that they would do everything that they could to fight him. And I think, and now let's assume that they're all fallen. Okay, they're not necessarily on the Lord's side. These aren't good angels. Mm-hmm. They're fallen angels, but they don't all have equal propensities to the same kind of vices. And so what is uh, something that one of them loves, I could very easily see another one saying, that's absolutely repulsive, and how dare you? In and fact, I, I know Brian, Brian is Brian even saying that, yeah, they're, they're, they're entities with their own personalities. Why wouldn't they be like that? Sure. And, right. and Brian has even written that into uh, some of his storylines where some of the gods are mocking another one who's, uh, you know, right. uh, yeah. Oh, no, I had by beating the heck out of them, you know, I mean, like, right. because they're territorial powers. So right. why yeah. wouldn't they want to bat- take the other territories of the other gods? Right. Yeah. And, but what and, I and how many is something a little bit different that if they actually see an evil that they just can't stand, oh, why would right. they actually fight against that evil? As fallen creatures, it, it, you know, whether they have their own motives to, to take over territory, just kind of lay that aside. Is it possible that they could do that just because they're so disgusted by it? And I would say, I don't know. I'm, I at least want to ask the question. That's an interesting thought. It is an interesting thought. And, and when, just to, you know, since we're talking across pantheons here, 
<laughs> um, if we're that's cross pantheon, cross pantheon. Uh, there, there's all kinds of heresy on this. Show. <laughs> um, but it, you know, if we're looking at this in terms of of you know comparative mythology, comparative religion, the these entities in, in other pantheons share another quality. They all share the the. the at least in the minds of the people that worship them, they share the capacity for the same kinds of bias and virtue uh, that humans do. It's just exaggerated, you know, within their their supernatural realm. Yeah. Um. So I, I, you know, to your question, Doug, I, I think that 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 certainly gives us room to consider the possibility, if not the probability. That these kinds of motivations uh, and variation in motivation exist uh, amongst these entities. Yeah, you know, I, I was going to say e- Egypt, for example. From as much as what I've been able to, to uh, at least discover, um, human sacrifice was not done in Egypt. You know, and if it was, it might have been done here and there. But the point was, was it was not an acceptable thing. So there's a perfect example. But of course, you know. Love, you know, Canaan loved child sacrifice, right? And and uh, human sacrifice, etc. So that might be an example of what you're saying. Yeah. And even though the well, uh, it, not put them into a box where where, where we where we tend to want to make them all as equally evil as we possibly can. Yeah. But it's, it's much more nuanced than that. And they yeah, all and love to do every evil. They all love yeah. to have and immoral not, sex, take drugs, <laughs> do you know? <laughs> but look, I don't think. Look. It's, I don't think it's a smooth. I don't think it's a smooth razor razor edge either. It's 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 a ragged edge. And what I mean by that is that, you know, Plato can sit there and pontificate about how, you know, Hephaestus and uh, Athena have have graced them with philosophy and democracy and all that other stuff, but hiding in their closet are all these other kinds of skeletons which speak yep. to, you know, what other what kind of entities are kind of you know working in the background behind them because because the Greeks did practice a form of human sacrifice kind of on the, on the down low yep. with their, I mean, the very word uh, pharmaco- pharmacon uh, mm-hmm. is a sacrificial victim from which words like pharmakia, witchcraft and drug, drug induced spellcraft uh, come from. Um, sometimes these were, these were outright uh, 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 ritual victims. Other times they were like in the case of Sparta, uh, where you had infants that were inspected when they were born, if they they perceive any sort of defect, and it, not just not just in Sparta, it was in other parts of the Greek world too, but Sparta is probably the most well known example of where these inspections, if they perceive some sort of weakness or deformity or something like that, they would they would leave the child to die to exposure. And that was called the pharmacon. Yeah, and there are areas within the Greek world, like the island of Rhodes, where uh, Human sacrifice was practiced to the god Kronos, who was the only one of the Titans right. who still received uh, any kind of cult. But uh, that was, uh, of course, passed on in the form of uh, child sacrifice in, uh, in the Phoenician world, Baal, Haman, Saturn, uh, likewise. So it, it still happened. I mean, it, it is bizarre, but uh, the, the truth is that the most popular festival in ancient Rome, the Saturnalia, was in honor of the god whose main, whose best known attribute was eating his own children. So... Uh, yeah, there, there were, I, I guess, degrees of evil as we look at it from our human perspective. But, uh, you know, biblically, we're, we're told that there is none righteous talk, talking about as humans. No, not one, uh, because the God, the standard of holiness and righteousness, we need to regain communion with God on a one to one basis and a personal basis is absolute perfection, which none of us can meet. Um, so uh, when if we're judging these fallen angels based on our own standards, and by definition, we're already using a flawed standard to judge how good or bad they are. Yeah, I mean, my purpose in bringing this up is not to uh, somehow justify a lesser sin. It's it's instead to bring no, no. nuance to the fact that. Yeah. Right, sure. right. Yeah. That, that we- when we think all in that, they're all kind of doing the exact same thing. We actually hurt ourselves and our ability to see the deceitfulness of sin. Yes. And how it ends up. You know how somebody who's who's giving philosophy and democracy. What is the end result of that under a fallen world? Um, <laughs> yeah. It's no better. <laughs> it just looks different. Sure. 
Yeah, we need to move beyond flannel board Christianity. You know, the little cute little cartoon uh, crit- critters and, uh, and uh, people that we remember from Sunday school. Uh, we, we're about 90 minutes into this. So to keep this to a manageable length, let's uh, let's wrap here. We'll have to do this again, because obviously there's a lot that's left unsaid and, and so much more, so many more directions we can take this conversation. But uh, uh, also, I, I suspect some of us have to sleep yet tonight and, and maybe do something <laughs> productive tomorrow morning. But uh, we'll go around the horn here. Uh, Brian, where do people find your work and where's the best place for people to keep up with uh, what you're writing? Well, um, Godawa.com, my name, G-O-D-A-W-A.com, everything there. I, I strive to make an in, interesting uh, website um, so you can find out all information about all my various series that I've written if you want to look into it before um, – before going any further. But the truth is, is everything's on Amazon. All my books, pretty much all my books are ebook, paperback, and audio book, all exclusively on Amazon, which if you go straight there, there's a lot of information you can find about each book before you buy it or, or series or what have you. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, Brian's most recent Amazon or Godot.com if you want more stuff. Brian's most recent novel is Moses Against the Gods of Egypt. And uh, the companion book, The Spiritual World of Moses in Egypt, is a fascinating read. Uh, Doug, uh, your most recent book, The Angel of the Lord. This is described in your website as the even newer book than the new book, Conspiracy Theory. Uh, (laughs) The Angel of the Lord, Biblical Historical Theological Study. Where do people find that? Yeah, like Brian, all mine are on Amazon and I have them in paperback and and in Kindle. And based on a couple of things I've seen Brian do, I'm trying to work on the hardcover of a couple of them. So more work than I thought it was going to be, Brian. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Judd, your website and, of course, a link to the Institute of Biblical Anthropology as well. Where where would people find your work? Uh, They can go to Burton Beyond. And, of course, just as Judd was giving his uh, response there. We lost the connection once again. BurtonBeyond.com is his website or uh, the Institute of Biblical Anthropology, where you can take courses from Judd, T-I-O-B-A dot org, T-I-O-B-A dot org. Yeah. In, the queue, in the queue, that were. <laughs> Eric? All right. Yeah, I froze up and uh, we, again, recorded on my side. So I just kept on talking and covered, you know, that's uh, I, I vamped, verbally vamped. Uh, guys, this was a lot of fun. We need to do this again. And uh, maybe, you know, we, I know we'd hope to get Josh Peck in here. We, we hope Josh gets uh, gets better soon. Uh, we got some other folks out there who I'm sure could also contribute. Maybe make this a regular uh, sort of, you know, once a month roundtable yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it would be so much fun. And, you know, if I hope that if I'm learning from you guys, which I've <laughs> learned a lot tonight. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Me yeah too. likewise. I, you know, I think it, I think it could be a benefit to the church. And that's really what I kind of I, that's what Judd and I were originally thinking when we thought of the idea mm. well i mean it's it's iron sharpening iron as far as as i'm concerned and maybe maybe that's what we could call the round table iron and miss oh yeah i, I like, like that i like that all right keep your eyes here because we'll uh, we'll see if we can do this and hopefully do it with a better connection next time but uh, uh guys thanks very much and uh, we'll we'll talk again sounds good yeah all right See you guys. Links to the websites of all of this week's guests will be in the notes below wherever you are consuming this podcast. And thank you for taking the time to do that. Coming up, $20 off the uh, conference coming to Dallas in March. We'll talk about the possibility of war with Russia. Are we really going to go to war with Russia? And some thoughts on a Rasmussen poll. If you share my opinion of the uh, medical dictates that we've been under for the last two years, There's a significant portion of the American population that wants you under house arrest or behind bars. That's ahead as a view from the bunker continues. Question. How do you fight something you cannot see? Davian is a third level master of the order. A small group of men who alone have the power to battle the most fearsome creatures in all of Saramond. For thousands of years, the Brothers of the Order have protected their world. Now, something has upset the delicate balance of power between man and dragon, and Davian must face what appears to be a dragon that cannot be seen. But Davian is losing his grip on reality, and the fate of the world rests with a stable hand, an underfed priest, and a gardener who's fallen from the stars. Iron Dragons, Book One of the Saramond Quest, by Derek P. Gilbert. New from Rose Avenue Fiction. 
Shall we begin? Let's begin now. Talking the walk Sunday nights from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is a view from the bunker online at vftb.net social media, Twitter at view from bunker, or you can follow my personal Twitter feed at Derek Gilbert on Facebook. The page is view from the bunker. You'll also find me on all the other alternative social media sites. Gab me, we get her parlor at Derek P Gilbert. Uh, I'm going to be careful about what I say here because um, this uh, podcast is automatically converted into a a video with a static image by the uh, podcast host that we use, Spreaker, and then sent up to YouTube. And um, if you find this podcast on YouTube, you might have noticed that the interview with Sheila Zielinski a couple of years ago was yanked. A couple of of weeks ago, excuse me, a couple of weeks ago, was pulled by YouTube because we happened to discuss a certain medical procedure that's been uh, required in uh, many parts of America, many places around the world, as... uh, a, uh, a requirement of uh, act going to a restaurant, a theater, getting on an airplane, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't even remember what we said. It was not a major, it was not the main focus of the, the, the interview, but uh, apparently it was enough for the censors to pull it and send me a warning saying, you get one more, you're going to be locked out of your account for a month, a week, whatever it was. So I'm going to be cautious about that, not because I want to comply with the censorship, but because a lot of folks have found our weekly Bible study that Sharon and I produce, the Gilbert House Fellowship, from through YouTube. And so that weekly Bible study has uh, reached hundreds of people, at least, perhaps more, who uh, prefer to use uh, YouTube to consume audio, uh, which, okay, great. You know, however the word gets out there, uh, that's, that's really what's important. It, it's the word of God. It's not our views on certain political things. Um, Sharon has to remind me of that from time to time, pull me in from the ledge, but uh, uh, not to say that politics isn't important, but it's not our main focus. Our, our one mission, according to our commander in chief, was to make disciples of all nations. And um, that doesn't happen at the ballot box. So having said that, if, if you uh, have a little trouble figuring out what I'm saying, just be aware I'm trying to avoid using certain code words that uh, might get this flagged by the censors. Uh, there's a study that was put out by Rasmussen reports last week that was a little bit surprising. Un- unless you consider the influence that uh, the-, the gatekeepers have, corporate media and uh, big tech, the messaging that comes from our the-, the messaging that comes through those gates is filtered to only allow certain points of view. And you can still get those. Um, I was listening to an interview on the Glenn Beck program this past week, and it uh, kind of explained how much influence those gatekeepers actually have, uh, big tech in particular. Um, If you're really convinced of your political views, whether right or left, um, the, the filter, the filtering by big tech is not really going to influence your points of view. But it's the people in the middle who determine the way elections go, the independent voters, those who are undecided. And uh, research over the last nine years or so has found that the filters, the algorithms used by big tech for searches can take a 50-50 split on a particular issue and shift it as far as 80-20. With, with people not realizing that they are being propagandized. So I'm trying to make more allowances for that in dealing with people who disagree with my particular point of view, uh, especially family members and, and friends. I do a lot of digging. I read a lot of uh, different news sites. I, I intentionally look at some sites that have a viewpoint that I really disagree with because I want to know what arguments they're making and why their points of view, why they justify their points of view. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's enough to change my mind. They may present something that I had not considered, but um, a lot of people don't do that. I mean, a lot of people get much of their news from Facebook. Don't go to Facebook to get your news. Don't depend on corporate media for your news. You have to dig a little bit. But at the same time, while you're digging a little bit for alternate viewpoints, don't filter the news in such a way that you're just confirming your bias. It's it's walking a tightrope. 
But, um, you know, it, it, it's just using the gift that God has given you of discernment to try to triangulate on the truth. Every source of news out there has a viewpoint. There is no unbiased source of news. I'm flattered when people say, you know, we watch your 5 and 10 program on Skywatch TV each week because you're the only source we trust. You're, you're unbiased. Well, that's not true. I do have a bias. I hope I'm open about it. And I'm not perfect. So while I, I appreciate very much those uh, w- kind words of support and um, certainly your prayers for wisdom and discernment on my own part, uh, please use you triangulate on the truth. Use other sources of news as well. And uh, we, we will get closer to it. So anyway, when you understand how the majority of people out there don't realize that they're only seeing what the gatekeepers of media and big tech want them to see then it's easier to understand how we can find ourselves in America in 2022, living as though there are two separate movies with very different plots playing side by side. And the people in our movie and the people in their movie are speaking different languages and viewing the world through very different eyes. So when Rasmussen issued this this survey last week, my first response was, I can't believe it. And then a second later was, well, wait, yeah, I can. I really can. Um, According to Rasmussen, 78% of Democrat voters really support, uh, well, Democrat voters generally are much more inclined to support the government using rather heavy handed tactics to enforce certain medical mandates. 78% of Democrat voters say they support compelling people to uh, take the uh, experimental serum. 58% support fines for those who don't. 59% support home confinement, house arrest for those who do not. 45% of Democrat voters, 45%, nearly half, support requiring those who have not volunteered to be part of the the experiment uh, to, and I quote from the survey now, this is the way they ask the questions, uh, the question to temporarily live temporarily live in designated facilities end quote temporarily live in designated facilities that's a nice way of saying they're in favor of sending those who choose not to uh, volunteer to an internment camp in 21st century america we want to incarcerate those who will not volunteer for this experiment of Democrat voters support government tracking for those who've not volunteered. 48% support fines or imprisonment for questioning the efficacy of the experimental serum on social media, radio, television, or online publications. Which means if if this were actually to be put in place, (laughs) I'd owe the government some money or I'd be locked up somewhere. And I'm not even the loudest voice on this particular issue. The thing that was most surprising was that 29% of Democrat voters support taking away children of those who've chosen not to volunteer for the experiment. But when you understand that, and this is, you know, trying to see the world through their eyes to get, to develop a little empathy, because you can't talk to somebody if, if you, if you just don't have any understanding of where they're coming from and why they feel this way. When you understand that the people who responded this way to the Rasmussen survey are getting their news from corporate media, which has spent the last two years stirring up panic over this virus, then then their responses make no sense. But that's what's happened. They a large percentage of the American voter American voters, the American populace believes that Uh, This disease is far more dangerous than it actually is. So there was another survey I saw a few months ago, and I don't have it at hand, but uh, it was roughly half of uh, Democrat voters when asked thought that the chances of being hospitalized if you contracted the virus was about 50 percent, when in fact it's it's closer to like 2 percent. So when you think, and of course, if you go to the hospital then you wind up intubated on a ventilator and then you die. That's the mindset of these people who are panicking, who are first in line, who are volunteering their children for this experiment, because that's what their news sources have been telling them. They're the ones who've been fed misinformation because the actual science and science is distinct from the science trademark. The actual data shows that um, 
the infection fatality rate prior to Omicron, which is milder than the previous strains, is uh, what, one and a half percent? Which is more dangerous than the seasonal flu, but it disproportionately hits those with underlying comorbidities like your elderly or your substantially overweight, which sadly is about half of America. There was a there was a study that was uh, published by The Lancet, which is a reputable medical journal in the UK, uh, April of last year, that found that the number one predictor for a severe outcome was um, a body mass index of 27 or above, which is defined by the World Health Organization as obese. That's overstating it. I mean, my BMI is close to 27 and I'm not obese. I could probably drop 10 pounds, but I'm not obese. Anyway, the, the fact is, though, there's a direct correlation and obesity is a greater predictor, a more accurate predictor of a severe outcome than any other factor, including whether or not you've volunteered for the experimental serum. But you don't hear that in the news because, well, we can't be fat shaming people. That's uh, that's no good. So because the way the, the because of the way the information has been filtered, people are behaving rationally, but they're behaving. They're, they're making decisions based on bad information. Now, how do you convince them of better information? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. By nature, I enjoy a good debate, but debate isn't always the way to persuade. Because when you start arguing with people, as I was trained to do as in the high school debate team, people, what they're hearing is not your, your arguments. What they're hearing is, you're stupid. And people tend not to respond well to that, uh, uh, to that approach. Anyway, that's what's going on here in the United States. But uh, thankfully, the messaging seems to be shifting as um, it's now being admitted that uh, natural immunity is superior, even during the uh, previous variant that it was uh, superior to, um, uh, say, artificial, artificially induced immunity. So uh, the uh, the changes are in the wind. Uh, in the UK, uh, the prime minister there has basically lifted pretty much all restrictions as of uh, Monday, I believe, as of tomorrow. Now, maybe um, uh, Prime Minister Johnson is looking for something to boost his uh, support among the people what with Partygate in the news. But uh, still, uh, good news is good news. The other issue that's really should be top of mind right now um, should be a bigger deal than uh, arguing over whether or not you should put something on your face when you go to school is what are we doing with Russia? Secretary of State Blinken met with... Um, Sergey Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister in Geneva on Friday, and uh, it appears that they've made a little bit of progress trying to read between the lines of the press releases. It seems as though the American government is finally taking Russia seriously when Russia says, look, we will not tolerate Ukraine in NATO and, and Georgia also, for that matter, which was a promise, by the way. That was made to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev back in the 90s when the uh, wall came down. It was promised that NATO would not expand into the former Soviet states. When the Soviet Union dissolved, NATO said, no, we won't we won't head eastward. We will not uh, move into the former states of the Soviet Union, like Poland and the Baltic states, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we NATO did shortly thereafter. And when Russia complained, the response from NATO was, well, you should have got it in writing. Okay, Um, that's not really a way to build good working relationships. So Russia has some reason to distrust words coming from Western governments. And I keep saying, because I want to be clear, I'm not carrying water for Vladimir Putin or, or for Russia. But you can understand why Russia would prefer not to have a country on its border with uh, NATO forces and uh, perhaps missiles deployed in, in, inside that country. I mean, 60 years ago, we went we very nearly uh, engaged in a nuclear exchange with Russia over Russian missiles in Cuba, 90 miles off the coast of Florida. So it's not like this scenario has not, you know, the shoe has been on the other foot within living memory of a lot of Americans. So why are we continuing to poke the bear? Why are we 
prodding the Russian bear here over Ukraine. Having read a little bit of history, and I'm not a historian, so I'm not claiming to be an expert in history, but look at the 1930s in Ukraine and the deaths of some 9 million Ukrainians who starved under uh, Joseph Stalin. You can understand why many Ukrainians still harbor some ill will toward Russia. But the fact is, there are parts of Ukraine, the Donbass, which is eastern Ukraine, where there are a lot of ethnic Russians, and there have been ethnic Russians for several hundred years now. Um, You can see why they might prefer to answer to Moscow than to Kiev. And so anyway, I, I, my point is that I'm sympathetic to Ukraine, but not so much that I would like to see American uh, American soldiers in a war with Russia for Ukraine. And, and I know this is not a, a popular opinion among many Americans who remember the Cold War. I'm old enough to remember having to you know learn how to duck and cover under <laughs> my uh, elementary school desk just in case there was a nuclear exchange with the Russians or the Soviet Union, rather. But um Look, uh, if Moscow, I mean, if, if, if Mexico, for example, were to sign a treaty, a, a mutual defense pact with, with China, I, I think we'd, we'd have a problem with that here in the United States. The, the fact is that Ukraine is in Russia's sphere of influence. And there are a lot of Europeans who are not really happy about this either. Europe gets about a third of its natural gas from Russia. And uh, January and February are very, very cold in Western Europe, Northern Europe, it, it gets really, really cold, which is, by the way, why Russia is really pressing the issue right now. Putin knows enough military history to know that uh, the best friend of the Russian military is uh, what's the, the expression? Generals January and February. Let's just pray that cooler heads prevail, that things can deconflict, and that uh, the United States and the UK, which is uh, just sent arms and advisors to Ukraine that uh, this isn't being pushed by uh, Biden and Johnson as a sort of wag the dog moment to distract from low popularity ratings right now. It, it in, in trying to look behind the scenes here, because as Sharon always says, we need to try to understand the theopolitics, what's happening in the spirit realm rather than just the geopolitics. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, it, it may be that this is all a uh, Hegelian confrontation. You've got thesis and the antithesis, the United States and the West and Russia. And the synthesis to prevent a uh, nuclear conflict that would destroy the world would be a global government. Hashtag great reset. That may be what is behind all of this. Well, $20 off a uh, conference registration. We are looking forward to traveling again um, and uh, getting back out uh, and, and meeting people again. It's been, uh, we've, we've had a few opportunities over the last year or so, but uh, not like we've had in the past. So we are looking forward to uh, uh, traveling and perhaps traveling overseas later in 2022. We're still working to confirm this, but uh, the, it's, it's getting close. We'll talk about that uh, um well, tomorrow, uh, well, by the time you hear this, it will already be up there. We'll talk about this on uh, uh, our, our weekly Bible study. But uh, here, the Watchmen coming back to Dallas. This is the uh, conference that uh, typically is held every March. It's uh, uh, obviously been canceled for the last two years, but uh, we will be back at the Hilton DFW Lakes Conference Center for the, uh, uh, they're calling it the, the Eyes to See Conference. And uh, this is March 18th through 20th. Dr. Michael Lake, Jamie Walden, Pastor Paul Begley, um, Michael Boldea, Dr. Mike Spaulding will be there. Sharon and I will be there. And if you'd like to join us, March 18th through 20th in uh, Dallas, use promo code GILBERT20, GILBERT20. And that knocks $20 off the registration when you sign up at hearthewatchmen.com. Now, early March, Sharon and I are going to be a small little uh, cozy event, an intimate gathering at uh, the Finley River Ranch in Sparta, Missouri. This is hosted by His Call Ministries, Alec and Ginny Wade. Uh, we're calling the weekend the return of Saturn and the Great Reset. Sharon and I will be uh, speaking, teaching, uh, answering questions Friday night, Saturday, and then Sunday morning. So uh, it's a whole weekend of Gilbert's. 
Hope you'll join us for that March 4th through 7th at His Call Ministries. Finley River Ranch is a wonderful location right there on the beautiful Finley River between Springfield and Branson. So if you're in the Missouri Ozarks or you can get to the Missouri Ozarks in a reasonably good time, we hope you'll join us for that. HisCallMinistries.com is the website. HisCallMinistries.com to get more information and to sign up. Got a couple more conferences to tell you about, and I didn't bring them up here on the screen. Should have done that before I started talking. Um, But uh, we will be in uh, Colorado in May. Prophecy Watchers is uh, heading back to... uh, The uh, Colorado Springs Marriott, they're calling this the Homeward Bound uh, Conference, March 19th, uh, not March, excuse me, May, May 19th through 22nd. Uh, This is $85 for registration. Sharon and I will be there along with Gary Stearman and Mondo Gonzalez, obviously, from Prophecy Watchers. Other speakers include L.A. Marzulli, Bill Koenig, Billy Crone, Ken Johnson, Ryan Peterson, author of uh, the... uh, Richard, Judgment of the Nephilim and the Final Nephilim, Dr. Tommy Ice, Tom Hughes, uh, Larry Allison, Nathan Jones, Dr. Randall Price. We can talk some archaeology. Bill Salas will be there. Brandon Holthouse. Look forward to meeting him. He's the one of the first pastors I've seen. Uh, watched a couple of his uh, sermons on uh, on YouTube uh, who actually preaches on the Nephilim. And, and knows who the Apkalu were in ancient Mesopotamia. So that's uh, pretty awesome. Uh, Doug Woodward, our friend, will be there. Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, Brent Miller Sr., Brent Miller Jr. Josh Peck will be joining us as well from uh, Skywatch TV. You can find out more at hearthewatchmen.com, hearthewatchmen.com. And then in July, the uh, Go Therefore Conference. We'll have more details on that, but that'll be the final weekend in July. So uh, that's uh, what's coming up. You'll find all of those uh Conferences, tours, other uh, upcoming events at uh, our website, gilberthouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, gilberthouse.org. So, uh, we, oh, by the way, the uh, Skywatch TV Israel tour, we back that up to next March. Next March. Um, Still praying for uh, clarity and travel, uh, hoping that Israel will drop those uh, requirements as far as travel goes. But right as of now, the uh, Skywatch TV Israel tour. Scheduled for March 19th through 30th of 2023. Uh, Allie Henson and Donna Howell from Skywatch TV joining us. And uh, Zev Porat, Rabbi Zev Porat from Tel Aviv will be there as well. You can get more information on that at uh, skywatchinisrael.com. Skywatchinisrael.com. Hope you'll join us. Uh, uh well, uh, hopefully, uh, well, next week, because uh, we're going to be uh, talking with uh, T.J. Stedman. It's long overdue. He's the author of a book called Answers to Giant Questions, and he uh, covers a lot of the ground that we just discussed this evening. So uh, uh, a, a very well-researched book and uh, covers a lot of uh, theology in it. Um, a lot of meat there. So we'll uh, that'll be video as well as audio, and that will be next week's program here on A View from the Bunker, which is a production of Gilbert House and released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Give us a listen to Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever else you find us, which is uh, wherever fine podcasts are sold. And remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker.